Hello everyone, this is Andrew Knight from RICS. I lead our tech partner program here at RICS. I've been with the organization for over 10 years, uh, sitting within our standard regulatory and thought leadership part of the organization. Uh, and my role as, run, uh, as part of running this program is to look at the whole implication of data and technology right across the built-in natural environment. And I'm really pleased today to, uh, to have uh, Bob Bray from uh, Autodesk here to talk about digital twins. So, so welcome, Bob. Thanks, Andrew. Great to Good. have you here today. Uh, as ever, the, the first thing that's always great to kind of th think through here is really um, a bit of a kind of a, a backstory in terms of your role within uh, Autodesk uh, and uh, the organization and a bit of a bit of a backstory in the positioning piece for Autodesk as a whole, because um, I'm sure many of our viewers are uh, uh, familiar with Autodesk. You've been around for a long time, but obviously it'd be interesting to hear uh, really how Autodesk see themselves in the kind of built and natural environment now. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I've been with Autodesk for about 24 years, always on the product side of Autodesk. So I uh, started my career really working in our uh, mapping and civil infrastructure product teams and, and building technology for civil engineers. Spent a number of years in our vertical design product group, really building technology, uh, really to help uh, building designers collaborate better. Products like BIM 360 Design, uh, I also spent a couple of years in our construction portfolio, uh, kind of main, mm. mainly focused on pre-construction. So I've kind of run the gamut of Autodesk, helping AEC customers uh, design and make things. And uh, today I lead uh, an effort at Autodesk around digital twins for the AEC industry, known as Autodesk Tandem. Right. Autodesk right. itself as a company uh, has been around for quite a number of years. As you know, Autodesk makes technology that millions of people uh, use to design and make the world around us. Our solutions are used to create all kinds of amazing things from green buildings to clean cars, smart factories, uh, to the biggest blockbuster movies, honestly. And our platform helps customers combine those technologies to solve their challenges, whatever the industry. Uh, so together we help our customers turn their ideas into new realities that shape a better future for everyone. Great, thanks, Bob. Well, you you, you touched on the, the the theme for today's uh, conversation, which is which is digital twins. And I guess like like any um, phrase, that there's probably sort of sometimes multiple interpretations of that. You know, within the built environment, people are talking a lot about digital twins, but they're talking about digital logbooks, passports property logbooks, lots of terminology floating around. And, and I always guess it's interesting to really try and get some clarity on what we mean by digital twin, because I don't think really everybody probably listening has necessarily the same understanding of what a digital twin means. And really, I think it's kind of important to focus on the kind of constituent parts, the the, the, the value that a true digital twin represents. I'll be really intrigued to hear what your your definition of digital twin is. Yeah, that's that's fair. And, and digital twin is definitely one of those buzzword terms uh, in the industry right now. Um, it, it is the favorite buzzword term right now, I think. Um, so for Autodesk, you know, a digital twin is really a digital replica of a built asset. But what's important about that is its ability to have a bi-directional connection between the digital and the physical. So what that does is it allows the digital twin to understand the operating kind of characteristics of that uh, built asset uh, and allow you to kind of simulate, predict, inform decisions based on what's happening with that built asset. So you say that kind of feedback loop is, is, is a fairly critical piece, isn't it? Rather than just that kind of very rich, but perhaps static replica that people might build, that if it can't actually have that kind of feedback and as i guess in in that context real time doesn't have to mean instantaneous the decisions it may be implying could be real time in 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 the, in the true sense of the word which is real time depending on the decisions you're making around that particular asset absolutely and and, and the critical part is really for me capturing what what is often referred to as a digital thread of information about that asset and and that might be early stage planning data that might be uh you know design decisions that could be construction uh, and, and the actual equipment installed in that facility, and then augmenting that through the operational life cycle, adding things like you know space utilization or space planning data to it, uh, maintenance management history of, of all of the components in that facility, so you understand maintenance history over time. And of course, you know the, the other buzzword of the day is IoT, Internet of Things. 
where you have sensors in the facility or in the equipment that's giving you real-time telemetry about, you know, it could be humidity, it could be temperature, uh, it could be occupancy, or it could be, uh, you know, the performance of a particular piece of equipment and the ability to monitor that. Um, of course, if you're collecting all of this history, then you can start to use that history to understand things like, you know, which equipment is performing or systems are performing as I expected or not as well as expected, which equipment might be giving me more maintenance headache than, than others, uh, right down to, you know, health and wellness of the occupants of the facility, if, if that's, uh, that's the type of facility it is. Um, the great thing about digital twins too, and this whole construct of course is, with BIM for years, we've talked about this feedback loop um, that we've really never had, right? Because we, we design a building, uh, we throw it over the wall to operations, they operate the facility, but there's no connectivity of this data. So this idea of this digital thread allows us to keep that data connected all the way through the life cycle so that we get that feedback loop and, and help people make better decisions about both the operation of their current facility, how do I tune this facility to perform better, but also how can I build better in the future? Mm -hmm. If I set some sustainability objectives and I'm not hitting those objectives, why am I not hitting them and what can I do in the future to make sure I do hit them? So I mean, given digital twins obviously have you know, a degree of cost to implement them. And, you know, clearly there has to be, you know, a value proposition to get that return on investment. I mean, it, it's, it's, I think it's a phrase, I'm not sure whether people use it anymore, that kind of sense of the, the killer app. But what, what do you see as the real strong kind of value proposition drivers that people can, you know, make, make as really strong business cases to justify the investment to, to build twins? I, I think the strongest business case to build twins is really, having that measurable performance indicator and drawing all of this data together to inform better decisions. Um, we've seen examples of really getting quite a good return on investment by understanding that asset and being able to tune those assets to perform better or make better decisions in the future. It's, it's really about that feedback loop and empowering that feedback loop. The, the other thing I would say, Andrew, is that I think you know, twins today, yes, there's a, there's a fairly high cost to implement today um, because the technology is still kind of budding in market, right? Okay. So we're seeing a lot of twins for existing assets uh, where there isn't a lot of design and construction data available to use. Okay. You, you don't have uh, any model data that you can use. So there's, there's a lot of bespoke data collection for existing facilities. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a lot of duct tape and bubble gum to glue all these mm -hmm. systems together, pull all this data together and, and make sense out of it. Um, I think the opportunity in the future is really to create a much more repeatable process around gathering all this information, being able to leverage this information in, in a highly repeatable way. And a part of that is, is what I like to say, you know, for new facilities, really harnessing that BIM process to make sure that we go through the life cycle and you're collecting that data at each step along the way. And instead of handing that owner at handover, you know, a thick stack of handover documents, which are typically PDFs, yeah. you know, give them all of the documentation that you contractually have to deliver, but along with that, a digital replica of that facility that indexes all of that handover documentation and is basically ready to connect their operational systems into. And by that, we can create a much more repeatable process for the industry in the future. Yeah, and I, I guess as an industry, that it is bedeviled by that kind of every, almost every project being a one-off or, or, or done in a way that doesn't have that kind of repeatability and that, that ability just to slot a process back into a new project in that way. So, so what's what sort of desks approach the digital twins in terms of, 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 of the way you've approached it as an issue, given such a long heritage as, a, as an organization delivering? I mean, I remember back in the 80s where, you know, a long time ago where, you know, Autodesk was already well known in that kind of design function. So with that kind of heritage, what, what's been the kind of approach that Autodesk have brought to this whole challenge and opportunity? For, for the AC industry, right, we have, you know, we started uh, obviously in, in architecture and, and drawings and, and those kinds of things. And, and as we've expanded through the years, right, we've built a product portfolio that really stretches from uh, architecture through engineering, uh, detailed engineering, 
uh, into construction. And we, we even have a construction portfolio now that is quite robust in terms of managing the construction process. And so for us, you know, we have all of this information now, we have all of the data and we have a connected life cycle. So if we can um, really harness that data and create a platform, and, and we built a platform called Autodesk Tandem to help us kind of harness all of that data and connect that data through the life cycle to maintain that digital thread all the way through planning, design, construction, so that at handover, you can basically have that digital replica of that asset that's indexing all of that handover documentation. So for us, it's really about four new facilities right now, making a highly repeatable process to create that digital twin uh, as a, a natural part of the design build process um, with as little kind of extra overhead as possible required, so as automated as possible. So you mentioned Tandem there as, as one of the sort of products within your ecosystem. Presumably you have a, a suite of products that, that come together to manage these the, these issues, as it were, if I can use that phrase, and then be able to produce all these these twins. Is that how it works? Yeah, there's a lot of data created in, in tools like Autodesk Revit or, or other design tools. There's a lot of design intent information captured there. But if, if you think about Revit, there's a lot of data in there that is specific to the design or the engineering effort and the owner doesn't care about that data. So how do we extract the data that an owner cares about, surface that in a standardized representation that is open and accessible through APIs and, and through open standards? Um, also, as you go through the construction process, we all know what gets built is not exactly what was designed, right? So there's always changes that happen mm. through the process. So being able to also capture those changes on the construction side or, or through engineering, let's say the designer specifies a particular piece of equipment in Revit, we want to know about that specification. But then if the construction team procures a, a piece of equipment that meets the same criteria, but maybe it's a different manufacturer, different model, whatever it is, you want to be able to capture those changes, make sure that that digital twin includes not only what was intended, but then also what was actually supplied, installed, when it was installed, its commission date, its start date, its warranty documentation, right down to the specifications of that piece of equipment so you know what its, what its proper operating conditions are so that if you have a sensor on that piece of equipment, you can measure and calibrate. I mean, what, one thing you, you mentioned a bit earlier, which I, <clears throat> I quite like to go back to, it was that comment about PDFs. I mean, the, the, the industry does seem to be, <clears throat> excuse me, slightly bedeviled with with lots of unstructured data. How, how are you sort of dealing and trying to address that? Because we do seem to still live in this world of PDFs and, and data that's actually digital, but not really digital. There's a, a standard uh, in the industry that's starting to become more prominent, ISO 19650. Um, division three of that standard talks about the asset information model, and, and it really defines a collaborative process for an owner or an operator to work with their project team to say, this is the data that I care about as an owner that I need to manage long term. So one of the ways that we're addressing this in Autodesk Tandem is to describe what we have, what we call a facility template. And that template basically codifies all of those asset information requirements in a repeatable way, allowing data to be mapped in from our design portfolio, from our construction portfolio, and creating that repeatable process that not only makes the process repeatable, but if you build um, you know, water treatment plants, or if you build data centers, or if you build healthcare facilities, you can create a standard template around all of the asset requirements for that, and then make sure that through the design and construction process that's filled in uniformly, number one. And number two, if you're standing up many of these facilities, you now have a standardized data schema so that you can understand how they behave as a whole. So I can compare one facility to another and its operating characteristics. And that's that's really important, that idea of an open standard and, and an open um, data schema for your facilities. Indeed. Um, just to touch on, once again, I guess, you know, uh, that that benefit you have of being in the industry you know so long in in terms of this idea of design and digital twins thinking of, of learnings from other sectors and i guess a lot of them a lot of us are quite familiar with the kind of 
Formula One example in terms of, you know, a really kind of dynamic digital twin with a car racing around a, a circuit or indeed an aerospace with firms like Rolls-Royce and I guess the other manufacturers having that kind of telemetry with, with their assets. What kind of things have, have you seen come across into the kind of built environment from those, and I don't mean this pejorative, but those kind of extreme examples, very, very sort of leading edge kind of digital twin environments? It, I think those, you know, the whole idea of digital twin honestly started probably with NASA and the moon missions way back, you know, in the, in the 60s, right? Um, but, you know, we've seen examples of digital twins in the manufacturing sector quite a bit. You, you mentioned Formula One, which is a great example. Aircraft engines are another great example because manufacturers monitor those things constantly we always know the state of, of aircraft engines that are, are literally in the air um so all of this is is great examples for us to draw on but all of those things really imply two things one having that structured digital data about that manufactured mm -hmm. asset and number two being able to collect that telemetry data in real time or near real time and associate it to um that design intent, that 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 actual construction or fabrication detail, so that you know, you know, when were those turbines last maintained, the exact state of those turbines in, in that aircraft, all, all of those kinds of real-time data. So it's really about having structured data. That's the biggest lesson we've learned is mm -hmm. we need to have highly structured data to really make this uh, a repeatable process for AEC. No, you're right. No, I, I remember well actually having a. Um, sitting down for lunch for something with from Rolls Royce and, and they were they were and this is ten years ago able to understand why a particular aircraft had had a a rather bumpy landing at Heathrow because that telemetry told them what, what was happening with the fuel as it came into land. And you know it's very impressive that that's been around so long as that kind of you know remote telemetry. We touched earlier, Bob, around that kind of challenge for existing buildings and, and as we all know you know the majority of the building stock is already out there it's already built and I guess one of the big challenges will be not only getting people to fully buy into to the whole BIM that that whole kind of design and construct methodology moving forward and indeed for retrofits but for these existing assets that make so much of our stock what, what are you seeing in terms of, of people getting to grips with how to kind of retrofit a digital twin onto a building that might not only be you know uh, never been bimmed but might be 100 years old you know it might be a you know an office block or a brownstone or you know something that's pretty pre-existing and and is not a great place to start from it's, it's a great question and and there are a few different approaches that that the world is taking around existing building stock um one is you don't always need a visual for the digital twin. Mm -hmm. you don't need that 3d model it, does it help? Yes, because it provides context to tell you where things are in that in that facility and and context in terms of the systems and you know this particular pump is connected to the system which serves these spaces. But even without that, right, you can start to uh, add sensors to existing building stock that will tell you about operating conditions of that facility. You can add sensors to existing equipment to also monitor existing equipment. Um, you know, for those that want that 3D context, there are also tools out there to reality capture those buildings and turn that back into a 3D model. So it really depends what you're trying to achieve. Um, but at the end of the day, I think there's multiple different approaches. Is it ever as clean as kind of you know the the repeatable process we hope mm -hmm. to create I, I hope one day we can automate much of that process but today it's going to be manual for at least a little while but it starts with understanding what you want to achieve and then making sure you can get the data you need to to achieve those objectives it almost i suppose goes back to that first question about that definition of a digital twin that there's a danger that the market assumes that it's not a digital twin unless it has that kind of 3d star trek type sort of you know visual representation when it's about the data not necessarily having a visualization in that particular way it's really all about the data it, it, you know the visual is is kind of there to serve certain use cases and purposes but it's really all about the data the data is far more important and, and its accuracy is far more important than the visual 
Uh, and I guess that accuracy point is interesting as well. I mean, it, it, one of the challenges, I guess, quite often is bringing data sets to, together from different sources. I mean, do, do you look particularly around kind of quality control, almost quality assurance about where data feeds are coming from? If uh, You mentioned that standard around assets, but that's always a bit of a challenge once again about getting multiple data sources in and understanding that you do have that kind of single source of truth. Yeah, and, and ISO 19660 Division 3 is really about understanding those asset information requirements, as I said, and being on the same page between the owner and all the project teams, and which project team is actually responsible for which portions of that data, right? So it's fairly easy if you understand what data is required and who's responsible for contributing it at what point in time to also write some rules to start to validate that information, right? Because if you take a new facility and it's you know it's a you know a very large data center 250,000 square feet plus right that's a lot of equipment and that's a lot of data to be verified and and if you're relying on humans to verify that you're in a bit of trouble so automating yeah. validation is obviously a very important critical part no, I, I, and I guess, I guess my, my last point for today's discussion is is we've already touched on our, you know, a huge number of potential use cases and things that could be done. And I guess there is a danger that in any project you might try and kind of start and boil the ocean uh, by building a digital twin. Well, what, what's your advice and kind of experience around how people can start the journey without that risk of trying to do everything at once and, and still get some payback, still get some value, but start with some you know, with baby steps to use that phrase in terms of how they begin to build a digital twin. Yeah, yeah my, my biggest advice is be pragmatic. Don't, don't try and boil that ocean. You, you don't need a digital twin of everything. Yeah, if it's a particular uh, type of facility, uh, you know, focus on one system, right? The, the most critical system, maybe it's, you know, a pumping station. So in which case, you know, you have multiple systems in that pumping station, you have, of course, your, all your pumping equipment and, and your water supplies, you have uh, security infrastructure in your security system, you have electrical infrastructure, you know, start with the most critical one, the pumping infrastructure, start there. And then maybe add in the electrical infrastructure and then the security infrastructure. So do it in a phased approach and really understand what you're trying to monitor and measure because you don't need to monitor and measure everything, you, you, you need to monitor and measure those KPIs that are most important. So I, I guess it almost starts with a, a non-technical piece around really business planning and understanding what's important from a from an outcome perspective, rather than jumping straight into bits and bytes and that kind of stuff. Yeah, it, you, you don't build a digital twin because it's it's the latest cool buzzword in, in the industry. You build a digital twin because you have a business need and, and a desire to solve that business need, and, and that really the end of the day for digital twins comes around to you know how do i get the most out of my my investment in my built assets and you know for each type of asset the answer to that question is going to be different you know for a hospital it's it's all about patient care at the end of the day but there's many systems in that hospital that help with patient care right um Data center, it's all about the bits that's being managed in that data center. And to do that, you got to keep that equipment cool, right? <laughs> um, at, at the lowest cost you possibly can from an environmental concern, right? You know, water infrastructure is another key one in the world today and, and really making sure that we can uh, both supply fresh water, drinking water to the world and, and also uh, process wastewater in an efficient way. Um, you know, those are those are key things. So understanding those KPIs you're trying to to achieve and hit, and then uh, building the right system to support that. And I guess you, you've you've triggered a, a kind of final question in me as, as you were chatting there about some of the kind of facilities that people are building twins on. I mean, it, it's it's obviously been in the news for a number of reasons recently, and, and driven more by COVID. But I guess we've got to talk about the security issues. The fact that that a digital twin is both of a tremendous opportunity but you're, you're building a data set there and a feedback loop that clearly mm -hmm. some bad actors might well want to break into i'm thinking of was it colony the um, um the uh, the refinery people in the states who had an unfortunate incident what kind of conversations and what kind of uh, of issues are, are you seeing around people's concerns about security and how they can be addressed in terms of you know making these systems open but closed at the same time 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to phrase it, is open and closed at the same time. Um, again, I, I think it depends on the type of the facility and and, um, and and the data that you're dealing with. But so take uh, water treatment plants are a great example or any kind of water infrastructure, right? They have SCADA systems that actually control all of the equipment in, in those facilities. You know, your digital twin may want to read and provide access to that SCADA history so that you can kind of see and understand what's happening within that facility, but maybe you don't want to give that twin complete access to the control system if it's in the cloud. Um, your cloud environments obviously need to be secure. You need to make sure you're meeting the latest security standards, all the patches are installed, all those kinds of things. So, so number one, trust your vendor uh, yeah. to have a highly secure environment. N number two, put the data in, in the environment where it, it makes sense, but uh, with the rigid controls in place so that you can't get those bad actors into the system. Um, so, so part of it is making sure your, your vendor is highly secure. Uh, part of it is, uh, you know, the right data in the right place um, so that those bad actors will never have access to it. I, I guess in, in, in that sense, is there also a point that people need to understand that uh, perhaps a digital twin isn't some monolithic sort of set of data sitting in a you know a virtual filing cabinet that it could be a kind of a fragmented in a good sense just a set of data that you can bring together and, and look at in silos when it's appropriate rather than having to put everything in the same kind of bucket as it were yeah and that's that's a great point and, and i left this out of my earlier kind of definition but for us you know and, and i think the world looks at this digital twins are an ecosystem of solutions working together and um, you know different people will have access to different parts of that ecosystem and that also helps with your security controls um, because you don't need to give the world access to everything in your digital twin um, one more point on that definition of digital twin if, if i can have another minute which is you know the other thing that i think people assume is the digital twin is not necessarily an all-encompassing thing uh, a digital twin may well be a federated set of twins working together. So if we go back to, um, you know, a factory example or something like that, each piece of equipment, each machine in that factory may have a digital twin of itself. You may have a digital twin of that fabrication line in that factory. Uh, then you may have a digital twin of the building and the machine is federated into the line, is federated into the building. Well, that building is also sitting on a campus of multiple facilities that typically make up that manufacturing plant. And so then that is federated into, you know, a digital twin of that campus and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so that federated nature of twins is also very important. Uh, when you look at the building, it doesn't need to know about all of the details of every machine. It maybe wants to aggregate all of the energy being consumed by those mm -hmm. machines, but it doesn't need to know the details of the machine. So that federation is really important in the digital twin ecosystem. And I suppose that, that leads you know, inexorably to, to that whole idea of governance and, and people understanding, as you say, you know, the purpose, who should have access. You know which feedback loops should be enabled and which are you know simply single directional feeds in, in that sense because the, the danger is you you do build something which perhaps goes beyond people's idea of what they can govern with, without those kind of building blocks and that understanding of as you say federation so well it, it's been fascinating bob to talk and, and i look forward to our, to our next conversation but for today thanks very much uh, great conversation look forward to speaking again soon thanks andrew really appreciate the time